Good morning again. Like, no time at all has elapsed since I just finished the introduction and other pages. So we're on to the fundamentals of grass-based beef, which is part one. And we're going to read from chapter one. <clears throat> oh, I just want to note this cover again. This cow is adorable, because we're both looking at this picture. Cows are kind of cute. I mean, that tuft of hair, he looks like, um, like Jim Carrey in Dumb and Dumber. I think I just got rained on a little bit. I just got some drops of water. Whoa. Oh my God. I read the last book in Arizona in 110 degree weather. And yeah, it's a little different now on the deck overlooking the bay. Um, in early October. So I'm a little more bundled up. But the birds abound. And let's get to it. I think I need to move on pretty quickly, actually, because these chapters can be pretty long. And ideally, we'll get through them in an hour. I don't know if that will always be possible. Let's see. Chapter 1. And we are reading from Grass-Fed Cattle, How to Produce and Market Natural Beef by Julius Ruchel. Chapter 1. The Great Herds and Their Grasslands. Long before hunter-gatherers began roaming the earth, the ancestors of our cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs, and domestic birds lived much as their wild counterparts do today. Flourishing within the balance provided by natural selection, nature's seasons, their specific environmental adaptations, and competition for resources with other species. They thrived remarkably well without us. When our forebears finally arrived on the scene, they interacted with game as predators, but barely made an impact on nature's vast abundance. He's actually completely wrong there. We killed all of the animals. Modern humans, however, have been far more intrusive. Yeah, in our own way, sure. Um, all right. I won't interrupt you, Julius, but that was in very much incorrect. We destroyed, we, we hunted did all of the giant animals and we ate them all. When we decided to domesticate animals, it was for our convenience, not their benefit. Domestication changed their lives in obvious ways. Their range was limited with property boundaries, for example, but it is a fallacy to think that we improved them or their lives in any way. Before we interjected ourselves, nature's creatures lived and evolved together to create a vibrant, healthy, self-sustaining balance among soil, grass, microbes, herds, and predators. They were remarkably successful, and much can be learned from them. Despite our, dismiss, our dismal record of environmental stewardship today, we persist in inventing expensive technological quick fixes and artificial solutions for the troubling problems we face on our farms and in the environment. We have forgotten how to look to nature, to the great wild herds and their rich grasslands for guidance and solutions. The good news is that we don't have to run to fertilizer dealers, seed companies, extension agents, and equipment dealers every time we want to increase our productivity and efficiency or try to resolve an issue on our farms. Technology has its place, but our first thought should be to look to nature for practical and ecologically sustainable solutions. Animals and plants evolved for millions of years to live in sync with their environment. We certainly have not changed them so much in our short period of influence that they have lost the specialized adaptations, characteristics, and natural traits that made them so successful during their long history. The ticking of geologic time. Our seemingly arrogant preoccupation with our technological solutions and human-contrived cattle production philosophies and our lack of trust in nature's answers to our production challenges can be traced directly to our biased view of evolutionary time. We mistakenly believe that we are central to history, that we are the glorious end product of a long linear progression of events. We believe that we have been around for a very long time. We even call the time before the evolution of modern humans prehistory, as if it is less important because we weren't part of it. Yet this prehistorical period stretches back through vast spans of time. Our human history is but a blink of the eye in comparison. This bias is hardly surprising if we consider how we experience the passage of time. 
I have a sense of how long a minute, a day, a week, and a month are. I also have a feeling for how long a year is, but grasping what 10 years feels like is a challenge. I doubt that even my grandfather, at age 96, has a true sense of what the passage of 20 or 30 years feels like. I can vaguely imagine the passage of 100 years, but a thousand years is beyond my comprehension. I know that 10,000 years is a lot less than a hundred thousand years, and that a million years is even more, but it's impossible to understand the experience of such vast spans of time. They simply become numbers that are detached from tangible human experience. Ain't that true? In the same vein, I know that after the dinosaurs roamed, mammals evolved, mammoths, saber-toothed tigers flourished, and then humans evolved and started chasing them. We endured a number of ice ages. We domesticated animals and plants at some point along the way, and finally the Egyptians built pyramids. The rest of history follows more or less the way we remember from history class. Geologic time happens over such vast periods that we simply cannot grasp its implications. Because we cannot relate to the vast passage of this time, we place the greatest emphasis on the brief, most recent interval we know as human history, a few thousand years. No wonder we overlook the significance of the millions of years of evolutionary history that our domestic livestock have under their belts. To get a true feeling for geologic time and how briefly we have been part of it, we have to put Earth's history in a context we can understand. The chart on this page compares the last 5.3 million years of Earth's history since the ancestors of our domesticated livestock evolved <clears throat> with a 24-hour day. This analogy makes it clear how recently we domesticated farm animals and how brief the last hundred years of our modern agricultural practices are when compared with the amount of time our domestic livestock and their ancestors spent adapting to specific environmental conditions. Let's look at this chart. A wrinkle in time. Although it helps to assign some numbers to the major events of evolutionary history, the vast scale of time associated with them still remains beyond our comprehension. Events shown in the boldface type highlight the long joint evolutionary history of grass and cattle and emphasize the very brief impact we humans have had on them. 245 million years ago, the first dinosaurs evolved. 244 million years ago, the first mammals evolved. 144 million years ago, the first birds evolved. 66 million years ago, dinosaurs become extinct. I always heard it as 65, but hey. 24 million years ago, grass co-evolves with grazing animals. 24 million years ago. In a way, it's pretty recent. 17 million years ago, the first horses evolved about the size of a dog, with three toes on each foot. 5.3 million years ago, mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, and the first wild ancestors of cattle, sheep, goats, and bison evolve on the great grasslands of the world. Five, that's like, that's with us, essentially. That's like when we came down. Basically, the grasslands happened because of changing climate. And as a result, a whole bunch of animals cropped up, including us. Apes came down from the trees. A lot of animals came from the trees. The, these, these animals that <clears throat> could eat the grass and get all those rich nutrients, that nutritional cycle began with the beginnings of the grasslands. Um, but it even took a while. We had grass like way before we had ruminant animals, it sounds like, from this. Which means that, you know, grass was like making its thing. It was starting and sprouting up in places, but didn't really dominate. You didn't have large grasslands like the savannas of Africa or, or wherever. The southwest, you know, the, the Native Americans in, the, in Kansas hunting buffalo, for instance, they... Right, that's a giant grasslands. These are real ecosystems. The nutrition in the soils are incredible. Anyway, we evolved with these animals five and five point three million years ago. That almost tracks with our own evolution. Okay. Um, where are we? Moving on from this. Mind-boggling, isn't it? Our livestock have been domesticated for only two minutes and ten seconds of their twenty-four hour history. Our modern farm practices have been around for only approximately 1.75 sec 1.75 seconds of this 24-hour history. Still, we naively believe that the solutions of our farm and livestock's health, productivity, and production problems lie in technology, biotechnology, petrochemistry, and pharmaceuticals that have yet to stand the test of time. 
Odds are that the production challenges we face on our farms would be better solved by learning how the wild grazing herds and their grasslands deal with nature's challenges and by exploring the evolutionary history of our domestic livestock. The great herds. Mm, let's actually look at this chart first. Below, the history of modern livestock compressed into 24 hours. So that's this, this whole clock. Uh, I don't know, do we need this? No, let's just get going. I think we get the idea. Time. Basically, um, if you look at it in terms of a day, humans and are super, 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 super at the end of the day, and uh, the Industrial Revolution is extra super, 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 super at the end of the day, right? Okay. The Great Herds. Until very recently in our busy but short history, much of the world's landscape was dominated by great grazing herds of one species or another. Today we can still see these remnants of these herds, which retain adaptations to their grassland ecology and characteristics that are shaped by domesticated livestock. Seeing the great herds gathering and moving through the plains, a hypnotizing, awe-inspiring experience, triggers us in a passion that may be a window into our long-forgotten past as hunters and predators. <laughs> He's triggered into a passion by the great herds. I understand. Certainly, the animal kingdom still recognizes humans as predators. Wild herds have much to teach us. Their environment, food, herd dynamics, calving, breeding, synchrony with the seasons, and even their relationship to predators all help us to learn about our cattle. Because we domesticated cattle, because domesticated cattle are so similar to the wild herds, we can immediately apply these lessons to improve the profitability of our livestock enterprises. Ooh. In New York, in, in New York, what? In North America, <clears throat> my brain's not working right now. In North America, the best known migratory herds were the Plains and Woodlands bison. Numbering close to 60 million, they shaped the Great Plains prior to their mass extermination by white people. Even as late as the 1870s, individual herds accompanying 50 square miles or more were sighted in the western Dakotas. Their enormous appetites and hoof power helped maintain the vast expanses of healthy grasslands and kept trees at bay. Their grazing impact caused rapid nutrient cycling, which in turn created the extraordinarily high organic content of the prairie soils. Capable of storing huge reservoirs of plant accessible nutrients, these soils are the North American grain belt's secret of success. Without the bison, the plains left behind by the receding ice age glaciers would have slowly turned to brush and forest which recycle nutrients and build organic matter at rates far slower than grassland under the influence of a migratory grazing herd. Only small spread out remnants of these herds still exist. Elk also once formed vast migrating herds on the Great Plains, as did pronghorn antelope west of the Rocky Mountains. The Four Corners region, where Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado meet, may once have been home to migrating herds of bighorn sheep in the Arctic, herds of musk oxen and migrating caribou define the high Arctic landscape, providing an invaluable source of meat to creatures along their migration routes and shaping the tundra that is their home. In Patagonia, at the southern tip of South America, there were once migrating herds of guanacos. Southern Africa had the springbok, which can still be found in small herds today. In sub-Saharan Africa, there are remnant herds of topi, also known as tiang, antelope, in southern Sudan, there is still a yearly migration of up to a million white-eared cob antelope, rivaling the great herds of the Serengeti. We can still see the herds of wildebeest, zebras, and Thompson's gazelles migrating across the Serengeti in Kenya and Tanzania. Remnant herds of Dorka's gazelles live on the edges of the Sahara Desert. There are even elephant herds roaming now in parts of Africa. Asia still has remnant herds of Chiru antelope on the Tibetan Plateau, Saiga antelope on the steppes of southern Prus Russia and Kazakhstan, and Mongolian gazelles, also known as Zeran, on the steppes and in the sub-deserts of Mongolia, northern China, and southern Russia. All these herds have been greatly reduced from their former, former sizes by hunting, habitat encroachment, and competition with domestic stock for resources and space, but in their glory they were truly great. Not long, not so long ago, these herds were accompanied by an even greater variety of species, from woolly mammoths and woolly rhinoceroses to prehistoric horses, woolly camels, and aurochs, wild cattle. 
a host of fantastic Ice Age creatures molded the great plains of their time with their grazing, manure, and pounding feet. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Most of us can relate to at least one of these great herds, and knowing about them will provide a benchmark to which we compare our ideas about cattle husbandry and livestock production. The legacy of these great herds will accompany us through this book, from our discussions of genetic selection and grazing practices to electric fences and water sites, as we try to replicate our domestic livestock what to replicate in our domestic livestock what we see in the wild. Lessons from the herd. A number of years ago, I had an opportunity to watch the porcupine caribou herd migrating south into the foothills of the Brooks Range in Alaska as part of its fall migration pattern. Over the course of a few days, I saw close to 100,000 migrating caribou, though the herd had split into smaller traveling bunches ranging in size from a few hundred to a few thousand. These groups were all within a few miles of one another, traveling across the tundra toward the same distant destination. From the valley floor, I could see many individual dramas, such as cows searching for their calves and individual caribou panting as they strained to keep pace with the herd. I saw hunters harvesting caribou and wolves harrying the weak members along the herd's flank. But from the hills above, another view unfolded. The individuals merged, their identities lost within the massive herds. Thousands and thousands of caribou were bonded together by a single purpose of mind, linked as if by some invisible glue, the individual dramas blending into the masses like little whirlpools in a giant river. The herd had gained an identity of its own. The individual caribou within it seemed like little more than tiny cells within a much larger body, unaware of their role within this giant living organism that slowly snaked its way across the tundra. Nor did the herd as a whole seem aware of the individual caribou within its midst. It swelled and flexed in response to the terrain, winding its way over the ridges and valleys heading south, driven by a higher collective consciousness. From a distance, the herd itself had become an individual, interacting instinctively on a grand scale with entire weather systems, vegetation zones, mosquito plagues, river courses, and wolf packs, just as an individual caribou might react to a gust of cold wind, the grass beneath its feet, the mosquito on its ear, the water in its path, and the lone wolf harrying its flank. As a collective, the porcupine caribou is herd is capable of shaping the landscape and vegetation of the Arctic and sustaining entire populations of wolves and other predators. Through its calving grounds, which lie in the middle of the proposed controversial oil drilling programs in the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve, it even influences the politics of global oil dynamics. To fully understand the wide-ranging impact of the caribou herd, we cannot limit our focus to the individual members of the herd. We must recognize the herd's identity as a whole. The, rel <clears throat> the relationship of the herd to grass, soil, water, nutrient cycles, climate, vegetation, microbes, and predators can teach us much more than an individual cow can. If we watch a flock of birds, we can observe the same phenomenon. With a rush of furiously beating wings, the birds lift into the sky and suddenly individuals disappear into the flock, now a cohesive, cohesive whole. Instead of crashing into each other, individual birds fly in perfect harmony as the flock twists and turns. They move as if driven by a single mind, working in unison for the benefit of the group. If we focus on an individual, we do not see its connection to the larger group. Watching the caribou mother calling her calf, we see an animal looking for food, struggling for survival, and seeking the companionship of her young. We see wolves feeding on the weak and vegetation being trampled into the ground. From this vantage point, we can study individuals within the herd because experts at caribou calls and the hunting strategies of wolves and learn, in, and learn about vegetation growth, but we will not gain an understanding of the instincts driving the herd. Only after we have stepped back and looked at the herd as a whole can we understand how the individuals are shaped by the dynamics of the group. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The relationship of the herd to grass, soil, water, nutrient cycles, climate, vegetation, microbes, and predators can teach us much more than an individual cow can. Of microbes, humidity, and feet. There's a picture here of the herd, by the way on the left. The porcupine caribou herd travels south into the foothills of Alaska's Brooks Ridge. They're so densely packed together, right? They're so densely packed. And the picture here below of microbes, humidity, and feet, in humid climates left, 
plant decomposition and nutrient recycling occur even without animal impact due to flourishing microbes both in and outside the soil's protective environment. In arid climates, right, animal impact must break down and return plant debris to the soil because soil microbes are not as broadly active. So we see that the ruminant plays more of a role in the arid climate as opposed to the hot, humid, jungly one. So it kind of comes down to climate and weather. It's helping to shape landscapes and then the animals are a part of it. Of microbes, humidity, and feet. Have you ever looked at the ground with your nose inches from the soil and poked around to see what is happening beneath the surface? No, I don't think I have. Have you ever sat in your pastures and tried to figure out how vegetation is recycled? Oh, right because I'm not a farmer. Have you considered what it takes to recycle nutrients back into your soil? Okay, yes, I will do it. What does, what does grass have to go through on your land to grow, flourish, reproduce, die, and be reincorporated into the soil so its nutrients become available to the next generation of plants? Not surprisingly, the decomposition and recycling process varies greatly throughout the world because of climate. Temperature and humidity are at the heart of the great herd's existence and therefore play pivotal roles in the herd's ability to create and maintain the Earth's grassland environments. Where I grew up in British Columbia's uh, Okanagan Valley, uneaten grass quickly browns and crisps in the relentless summer heat. By early fall, though, the rains start, and by early winter, they've washed many of the nutrients from the plants. The wet snow crushes the plants to the ground, and within a year, the stalks are indistinguishable from the rest of the organic layer in the soil, gone, reincorporated, from dust to dust. Untreated fence posts rot from the top down almost as quickly as from the bottom up, and a tree that falls in the forest turns into a mushy, rotten mass full of centipedes and beetles in just a few short years. In the rainforest in, on Canada's west coast, the nutrient cycling occurs even more quickly. The microbes that break down dead organic materials are extremely active year-round year round above and below ground in this warm, humid environment. In arid regions, however, the story is very different. Although fence posts still rot where they come in contact with the soil, material above the soil surface seems to last forever. The dry, dead grass oxidizes, turns gray, crumbles, and blows away in the wind, never returning to the soil. Years later, dry grass still stands, almost as if it died just the day before. Dead trees in the forest seem to be permanent fixtures gray on the outside. The dry wood hardly seems to change, only growing less dense with time until it finally disintegrates. Things don't seem to rot in such a climate. Why? In order for nutrients to be recycled back to the earth quickly, the microbes that decompose dead plant and animal remains must be active. Like us, these microbes need water to function. In humid areas such as rainforests, microbes can do their work in the open air. But in dry regions, the microbes work efficiently only in the moisture zone below the soil surface. Until dead material can make contact with the soil, it remains untouched by these microbes. Nutrients from these dead organic remains are not recycled back to the soil for future plants. Instead, they disappear into the atmosphere through oxidation or are broken down by the wind, ultraviolet sunlight, and physical weathering until they blow away as dust. Herds are nature's steamrollers and plant crushers. Rainfall and warm temperatures alone do not drive this process. More important is the humidity in the air between rainfalls. The decomposition microbes need the right balance of moisture and temperature to survive and work efficiently. If the air is very dry, the microbes will become confined to the moist soil, becoming less and less active as the soil dries out. Some areas may get high rainfall amounts over a relatively short period and have tremendous plant growth, but if the air is dry for the rest of the year, the dead material won't decompose and be recycled unless it is physically pushed down into the moisture zone in the soil. Other areas may get less rainfall, but if they are more humid, the microbes can continue to work above ground, breaking down and recycling dead plant material even before it contacts the soil. As an area becomes drier, microbial nutrient recycling becomes less efficient and we have to look to some other process to help break down and recycle dead plant material. We can certainly turn on sprinklers or use heavy equipment to mash the material and bring it into contact with the soil. But at what economic cost? Mother Nature has a much simpler solution. Hungry animals, sharp feet, 
and manure. If we look at the distribution of animals around the world, we recognize an interesting trend in humid areas such as the rainforests around the globe where microbes can be active outside the soil year round, we see more and more solitary animals or small groups of animals spread uniformly throughout the area. Yet in areas where microbial activity is limited by decreasing rainfall in humidity or by the onset of a dormant winter season, when temperature drops, temperatures drop below the microbes comfort zone, we see larger herds of animals clumped together. There is a grand advantage to this massing of feet and mouths. Herds are nature's steamrollers and plant crushers. Animal grazing plays an important role in ecosystems. Animals eat grass before it can become old, dry, and unpalatable. Periodic grazing maintains grass in its growth, or vegetative stage, during which the plant roots spread out, much as they do in a lawn. As the grass extends across the soil, it becomes an insulating layer that shields the earth from direct heat, which in turn helps to retain moisture. When the rains finally come, the carpet of live grass and dead grass litter slow dead grass litter slows the water runoff, giving it more time to be absorbed by the soil. The more water is absorbed, the more water is stored, and the longer it will take the soil to dry out after the rains. Useful in California, right? It sounds like an ideal arrangement because it is. Grazing animals, grazing animals and grass are a perfect match. They co-evolved 24 million years ago to take advantage of each other's best traits. Animal feet knock over the dead plant material, driving it into the ground so it contacts the microbes in the moist soil. Looking closely at the feet of the majority of animals that make up the great herds, including cattle, we can see that most have two toes on each foot as they step and especially as they step violently, these flexible toes twist and flex, particularly at the front edges of the hoof, where they are the sharpest. The sharp hooves slice up the dead plant material as they push it down into the moist soil, where the active microbes are waiting for lunch, and also fracture the ground, allowing rainfall to penetrate easily through the hard crust on the soil surface. Plant material that has been trampled further slows rainfall runoff, and the depressions left by the animal's hooves create little pools to hold water. It's really that literal. There's a picture above of a hoof, a grazing animal's foot in action. The toes twist and flex, slicing up dead plant material and pushing it into contact with the moist soil layer. The footprint behind shows water being absorbed by the fractured soil. But that's not all. The animals also leave behind their manure and urine, pure gold to the microbes. After dead plant material has passed through the digestive tract of a grazing animal, the finely chewed and partially digested material becomes much easier for soil microbes to digest. Manure piles also provide a perfect moist environment in which soil microbes can flourish. This is why cattle, bison, and so many other grazing animals have se such seemingly inefficient digestive processes that appear almost wasteful. Poor conversion rate in scientific jargon. Partially digested plant remains play a vital role in feeding the soil microbes which keep the soil fertile. Plant digestion in the soil has a great deal in common with plant digestion in the rumen of the cow. In fact they are intimately linked in a healthy grazing environment. In the first step of plant digestion in the cow, grass must pass through the rumen in the first chamber of the cow's stomach which contains a host of microorganisms responsible for fermenting and breaking down grass's tough cellulose structure so that the cow can extract nutrients from the cellulose as it passes through the rest of the digestive tract. Digestive tract. Many of these rumen microorganisms are the same as those that live in the soil, where they are responsible for the decomposition of plant materials, likewise breaking down or digesting the tough cellulose structure of dead plant remains to extract nutrients from them for the use of future plants and other soil microorganisms. The soil can support only as many decomposition microbes as it can feed from dead plant remains in the earth. Very little dead plant material is accessible to the soil microorganisms until grazing animals trample the plants and return partially digested plant remains to the soil via their manure. This trampling creates a surge of dead plant material in the soil, but unfortunately it takes time to rebuild the populations of soil microorganisms responsible for digesting these plant remains. Complicating matters is that there is only a limited time period during which the soil microorganisms can unlock nutrients contained within the dead plant's tough cellulose structure to make them available to new plants in time for the next year's growth season. Remember cellulose is 
the word for fiber, land fiber. This time period is shortened even further by the arrival of the drought season when soil moisture levels drop substantially and cause a marked decrease in microbial activity within the soil or the arrival of the winter season when cold soil temperatures also decrease microbial activity, which drops off sharply when soil temperatures fall below 9 degrees Celsius, 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Nature offers a solution, however. Every time manure falls onto the ground, an enormous number of rumen microorganisms are carried with it and are incorporated into the soil by the animal's trampling hooves. Because these microorganisms are the same as the soil microbes responsible for plant decomposition, this food of rumen microorganisms boosts soil microorganism populations at the very instant when passing herds migration provides a surge of dead plant remains. Thus, plant decomposition can take place quickly within the limited time framework available. The flood of microorganisms in the manure provides an enormous kickstart huh, to the decomposition process in the soil, allowing it to occur in the available window. To add yet another reason to marvel at this perfect match among animal, plant, and microbe, we need only look at the role of urea, nitrogen, in both the soil decomposition process and the ruminant digestive process. Hey, rock man. Urea contains an easily digestible source of nitrogen-rich protein, the primary fuel that feeds the rumen and soil microorganisms responsible for fermenting and breaking down grass's cellulose structure. Rocket scratching. The cow's body produces urea naturally in the liver. Some is sent to the rumen directly through the rumen wall, and some is introduced via the cow's saliva into the plant materials it consumes. Excess urea produced by the liver is excreted via the kidneys in the form of urine, which in turn feeds the microorganisms responsible for digesting dead plant remains in the soil. Thus, urea in the cattle's urine not only provides nitrogen fertilizer for the next growth phase of plants, but it also fuels the microbes working in the soil. Without enough nitrogen in the soil, the microbes become inactive, as they do when the soil is too dry. Clearly, large grass-eating herbivores grassland and the digestive microbes in both stomach and soil evolved simultaneously. That is fucking incredible. Jesus Christ. Okay. Are you hearing this? It's like they're a freaking team. Like, wow. Okay. Nature is amazing. How these lessons translate into practice. Nature does not have one hard and fast rule for everything. The process of plant decomposition changes dramatically dramatically, depending primarily on the humidity and temperature levels that keep the digestive microbes active. As a result, we farmers have to adjust our grazing impact and management practices to compensate for conditions that become increasingly challenging to the microbes, such as humidity and temperature changes from one climate to the next or from one season to the next. On one end of the scale are extremely humid rainforests where nutrient cycling and organic decomposition occur very quickly without animal impact. From this we can see that a human environment allows great flexibility in how we manage the grazing habits of our livestock. On the other end of the scale are landscapes that are utterly dependent on grazing herds to maintain the nutrient, si nutrient recycling process. Without sufficient animals in large migrating herds, such landscapes become less and less fertile over time. In arid environments like these, without a well-managed grazing strategy, the heat or cold, yes, those are birds, Rocket, heat or cold and drought can take a toll on plants and soil. Soil between plants becomes bigger, soil, excuse me, spaces between plants become bigger and lush grasses are slowly replaced by scrubby plants and bushes that are able to cling to life without the help of periodic grazing. As more soil is exposed, the cycle spirals downward until a new balance is struck with the conditions that remain. Extreme outcomes of this downward spiral are seen in places like the Sahara Desert, where little more than a vast wasteland of sand remains in an area where, only 6,000 years ago, vast grasslands flourished, as in the Serengeti in East Africa, or our North American prairie, kept healthy by the great herds of elephants, wildebeests, gazelles, zebras, and giraffes that roam them. There is this unique comparison between America and Africa because we have, we both are home to giant grassland environments. 
in parts. Grazing intervals, herd sizes, plant species, and herd impact are not the same throughout Europe or Africa or in the American Midwest, Southeast, dry desert rangelands, or intermountain regions, yet management practices that are developed in one climate and socioeconomic environment are often precisely exported to other regions with little or no consideration of the long-term negative effects they will have in a different environment. This cookbook approach to farming may be convenient in the short term, but in the long term it does significantly more harm than good. For example, many European practices have been exported worldwide, including those of summer following, a preference for small, evenly distributed cattle herds, making and storing winter feed, and using barns to house animals in winter. These European practices are as much cultural as they are products of a wet, relatively warm climate, where microbes are active above the soil surface almost year-round. It could be argued that these practices evolved to address the climatic challenges in Europe where winter grazing reserves are easily leached of their nutrients and wet fields are susceptible to trampling damage during the muddy winter. Yet the cultural reality of medieval Europe played an even greater role. In the damp, cold climate, people were exceedingly poor. They built their homes alongside and on the top of animal barns so they could keep warm. Homes were heated in part by the rising warmth thrown off by the barn animals and the heat emitted by the composting manure pile under the house. Hay production and feed were developed to warm meager homes during winter and to allow farmers to oversee their animals at night and avoid theft in a starving society. European winters are less than ideal for shepherding cattle not because the cattle cannot graze through the snow but because the cold wet climate would kill any human shepherd trying to spend a day or worse yet a night outdoors in those conditions. Stored feed in barns kept people out of the weather during winter. It also allowed cattle to maintain a high enough level of nutrition during winter so that people could continue milking them as a source of food for themselves and to produce a saleable product year-round. Milk and cheese were often two of the medieval farmers' few sources of income. No matter how inefficient and labor-intensive this stored feed production system was, farmers could not avoid, afford to stop milking their cattle. Ironically, this approach to cattle husbandry has persisted and been exported to almost every corner of the world, regardless of differences in cultural and climatic realities. There's a pay, uh, 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 chart, picture chart on the previous page, the downward, downward spiral of poor grazing management. Number one, lush grass, no better soil, space between the plant increases, basically more spaces between plants, lush grass replaced entirely by bushes, scrub, brush, and weeds. Number four, the only, only the hardiest weeds and woody scrub brush remain. Bare soil begins to dominate. Topsoil erosion via wind and water severe. Hard pan develops crusts on soil. Bare soil dominates. Erosion is extreme. The soil is virtually unprotected from wind and water erosion. A poorly managed grazing strategy causes a downward spiral of decreasing soil productivity, weed infestation, loss of vegetation, soil crusting, and erosion. And you could say that that happened because it was abandoned by herds for whatever reason maybe because they were um hunted to extinction i don't know <laughs> but animals absolutely in a very 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 real way um affect things like rocks and soil like the inorganic supposedly inorganic matter right um it's it's like very real. The first mass extinction was occurred in the oceans because almost all life was in the oceans. But then these early, early plants like mosses and and like little, you know, tiny, gross little um, mosses and crap climbed out of the ocean and leached and basically lived on rocks. And what happens is is when plants and lichen or whatever live on rocks, they're actually in a relationship with that rock, and rocks will end up leaching minerals and so forth at like 40 times the usual rate as a result of these plants. So what had happened is that these plants, for the first time ever, were on land, and for the first time ever, were leaching all sorts of minerals and whatever, what have you, into the waterways, and the oceans... Uh, completely changed in their pH and it killed like over half of all living things in the ocean. Whoops. So, you know, 
little little moss can change the world. Okay, herd migration. Livestock are tools to create and maintain healthy grasslands, but they must be integrated properly in order to have the desired effect. There is no single correct form of integration. In rainforests, countless species of animals are scattered throughout the whole ecosystem. They do not congregate in large migrating herds. Their presence works, uh, though they do not rather congregate in large migrating herds. Their presence works. On the other hand, in dry regions, we see enormous herds of grazing animals that are constantly on the move as giant grazing units, intermingling with other grazing species and never spreading out evenly across the plains. These dry areas need animals, and lots of them, to keep the land healthy. But for their presence to work, they have to be concentrated to provide maximum impact on the land over the shortest time possible. But how do we make sure that the violent impact of the herd is in the right proportion? Not so much that it tramples the living daylights out of the grass, and not so little that its impact makes no difference. The herd's impact must be measured or rationed. The key is migration. Animals have to move on. Migration in the wild is driven by the search for fresh grass as the grass is quickly depleted around the giant herd. If individuals in a herd spread out across the grassland to graze, each animal picks and chooses which plants it eats and where it steps, causing the herd's total impact to be very irregular. When a large herd grazes together, however, the impact of the animals is evenly distributed across the land. Competition and the need to keep up with a group before all the good stuff is eaten compel the animals to trample and eat almost everything in their path. I can't be too picky or everything will be gone when I get there, and I can't take too long looking for the best place to put my feet or the herd will push me aside and leave me behind. The herd benefits from this arrangement just as much as the grass does. Grazing as a compact migrating group guarantees that it will continue to find abundant, high quality grass all along its migratory route. Selective grazing would cause desirable plant species to be overgrazed and would give undesirable plant species the competitive advantage, causing a slow deterioration of the quality and quali quantity of the herd's grazing supply. So really, you need competition, right? That's like a huge part of this, is competition. The herd is, yeah. Grazing as a group also decreases the vulnerability to predator. <laughs> Grazing as a group also decreases the vulnerability to predators of each individual animal in the group. This reduction in stress makes them much more nutritionally efficient than when they are spread out and grazed individually, which easily compensates for the reduced selectiveness in their nutritional intake. So, like a giant beast, the herd moves on, always searching for fresh food, leaving behind a grazed and trampled swath. Livestock are tools to create and maintain healthy grasslands, but they must be integrated properly in order to have the desired effect. If the herd stays too long in one place or returns to an area too soon, it grazes the tender regrowth while it is still small and weak, making the desirable plant species less competitive than undesirable species by grazing it before it is strong enough to recover quickly. If the herd doesn't return soon enough, though, the dry, dead material will choke out the live regrowth underneath it, suffocating it and blocking the necessary sunlight. Staying too long or returning not soon enough, then, leads to takeover by less desirable plants. Weeds dominate, and the good grass becomes patchy. Likewise, too much, too little, or inconsistent trampling by the herd means that the ground does not efficiently absorb rainwater. The herd's impact must be applied in the right intervals and in the right amount for the grassland to remain healthy. Predators, nature's shepherds. We see the value of the herd, but try telling your cows to stay together when you let them loose on your farm. They spread out over every square inch of available land, targeting the choice grass species and chewing them completely to the ground before they will even consider touching the less desirable plants. On their own, they don't have enough common sense to stick together and migrate as a herd. So while, so are wild animals smarter? If the great herds migrate as a unit to give the land the right measure of impact and rest, why doesn't the same thing happen when humans get involved? Remember the wolves I described harrying the caribou herd? Therein lies the answer. Not only do predators fulfill the well-known role of purging weak members from the herd, thereby keeping the bloodline strong, but they also play the vital role of keeping the herd bunched together out of fear. But they are commonly missing from our farms, and wild herds naturally disperse whenever predators are eliminated by guns, poison, and traffic. And so while the predator's fangs replace the shepherd's protection, and the predator's effect on the herd as a whole, it plays the role of nature's shepherd. Both the shepherd and the predator keep the herd bunched together and migrating 
as a group, albeit for different reasons. The individual is most secure, not really for different reasons, pretty much the same reason. The individual is most secure, <laughs> food, most secure in a large herd. The likelihood of being eaten by predators is significantly smaller when there are many others in the herd from which predators can choose and when weak animals lag behind or are jostled outward to their exposed edges of the group. The wolf, lion, hyena, and bear all have roles to play along the flanks of the great herds. These predators incite the fight, fight or flight fear response that glues together the herd and causes the animals to migrate as one. Fear of predators keeps the herd milling around. F keeps Fear of predators keeps the herd milling around, breaking up the soil and dead grass underfoot and uniformly grazing the food supply, and also helps drive the herd forward in search of greener pastures. By contrast, a calm herd without predators drifts apart, each animal seeking the easiest route and avoiding brush and prickly vines. Through their rigorous selection process, predators also keep the genetics of the herd strong. The herd, in turn, places within its reach along the herd's periphery a vast supply of meat in the form of old, weak, injured, and newborn animals. There is a perfect symbiotic relationship among the soil, grass, microbes, herds, and predators. It is this relationship that we must mimic in our domestic farm environment, replacing the predator with shepherds, or the bite of electric fences, to drive migration or pasture rotation, and to focus the herd's grazing impact by keeping the herd bunched together as a group. Shows a picture here below of a herd. It says fear of predators keeps the herd bunched up and moving. And we see a bear. Oh, that's it. End of chapter one. Not so bad, 47 minutes almost. All right. Mm. Cool stuff. So that, yeah, that's Chapter one kind of does introduce all sort of like these basic concepts. We're we're just trying our best to mimic the successful aspects of nature. So much different than factory farming, where basically they're taking cows and feeding them grain and then just kind of turning them loose. It doesn't matter if they're really pasture raised or not if they're not really done, if the system is not designed for them to effectively attack grass, like the eating machines that these things can be when they're feeling competitive and in a group and, you know, talking to each other the whole time and getting into it and moving as they go, it's exciting for cows to live this life. And in a way, we have the possibility here to do it even better, I dare say, um, because the fear of predators, it, that, that dynamic is, is slightly different than it would be in nature. So we can actually have the opportunity to create maybe even less stressful lives. We can take the, the aspects of civilization that have improved our lives and allowed us to lead lives that, you know, m many times um, are without the stresses that we used to have of, you know, potentially being eaten by lions or going without food or that sort of thing. Um, of course, we have whole new long-term stresses and chronic issues as well, but, but there are some aspects of civilization that if you just look at the math and look at the numbers, absolutely are good for people, right? Um, healthcare and technology, that sort of thing. All these things make a world of difference. Well, we can apply these things these concepts of security basically to a cow's world but then also encourage the competitive eat all the stuff you can find trample the ground improve the earth um, bonuses that we get from cows when they're in a herd and together and acting with a group mentality the way they're designed to do um, the way an optimal cow lives, I should say. And you know they're optimal because they're going to end up being healthier and, and happier. And have improved health markers and all these things. Compared with the cows at a factory farm, they may turn them loose in a pasture and you see a bunch of cows like 
just kind of spread out on a hillside or something here in California. I used to think those were the happy cows. They say happy cows and all that, right? Happy cows are bunched together. Happy cows are bunched together. That's almost the lesson here of chapter one, right? Just cows are meant to be grouped together in a tight social group. That's how they have fun. But they will spread out because they're going to ultimately, you know, their stomach rules the day. And if there's have if they have the opportunity to just spread out and eat the best plants selectively you know which isn't good for the environment either they will do that and they will be less happy but they will be um they, they probably won't even be fatter but they'll be going for the the good grass supposedly it's just like it, the the balance is off in that instance so you see those cows spread out. Those aren't the happy cows. It's the bunched ones. And the factory farming, they occasionally do bunch them extremely tightly um, in probably poor ways. But that's like basically just to store them and then to force feed them grain, essentially. Not force feed them necessarily, but it's all they give them is, is grain, which is not at all natural for the cow um, to be eating these grains they eat grass it's there's a, a distinction instead of grain byproducts from our bread basically so when they give them all this grain they make them sick um, and the cows are in no relationship with the earth anymore at that point it's so sad it's so sad sad a lot of people are saying so sad factory farming Many people are talking about this. Factory farming, so sad. So sad. Against nature, many people are saying. So, let's grass feed these sons of bitches. And wow. Lastly, I'll just add that if you're listening, Trump, if you try a grass fed steak, a few times to like let it grow on you you will never go back because good lord those steaks taste so much better that fat is just like candy oh yeah ah, can never forget that food is a part of this equation and we're this book is about the business of of growing that food and changing the planet so onward to chapter two after this